Happy Good Friday, everyone. This is Griever here, bringing you guys the latest behind the bar reviews for One Piece, chapter 940, A Spark of Rebellion. Now, before we get into the chapter, just want to say once again, happy Good Friday to everyone. I uh, hope you're enjoying your long weekend if you celebrate Easter, and happy Easter if you celebrate Easter and stuff. My version of celebrating Easter is watching the Ten Commandments and eating a ham dinner, but uh, nonetheless, that's just the way I do it. So if you guys do more things, you know, and some such, uh, either way, just well wishes to everyone for this nice long weekend. That being out of the way, let's just get right into the chapter, because exposition. Let's talk about exposition for just a few seconds. It's great. It's great in One Piece. World building and exposition and dialogue, heavy chapters are perfect for One Piece because generally speaking, we get a lot of information to add so much more to theories. Some theories get basically axed because of this nugget of information and some actually get more evidence boosted to their wild ideas. It's wonderful in One Piece because it's such a long running series. Unfortunately here, in this beginning part of the chapter, I felt like it was a bit of waste of pages, and I'll explain. At the beginning of the chapter, we get basically uh, Nami and uh, Usopp talking about the fact that basically Law left. Law said, hey, rem I will always remember, you doubted my crew, you doubted my friends. Remember that Law, unlike Kid and a lot of the other supernovas, Law is very similar to Luffy in the fact that he is a pirate in name, but he's not exactly a pirate on the level of Kid or Blackbeard or, or Kaido or somebody like that. Law, his crew are his Nakama. And so he says, I will never forget that you doubted my friends. And in this life or death game we're playing here in Wano, how can I trust you to have my back? This is a very honest question. I've seen this in series such as Inuyasha and Gundam Seed and uh, Escaflone. I've seen this trope brought up before. Not so much a trope, just honest reasoning of military men basically saying, look, we are in, we are going to war here. We are having a battle. And if I can't trust the guys behind me holding a knife, you know, I can't be paying attention in this very important battle. I can't be a paying attention to my back as well as my front. I need all my focus on the front. And if I can't trust the people on my back, what are we going to do? So this is actually very good reasoning on Law's part. And I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm sitting back there like, Law, you got a point. And Usopp and Nami are talking about this. They're saying like, yeah, you know, that makes sense. At the same time, though, it also makes sense uh, from Shinobu's thing. And I already brought up in my previous reviews about Shinobu's reasoning. It does make sense. And Nami basically, you know, compresses it down to a couple lines of dialogue. But it's basically what I was saying in the last chapter about, uh, or the previous chapter review, all about, you know, this has been 20 years. They're not playing a game. You know, they they will literally sacrifice a bunch of strangers to save their one clan member sort of idea because it all hinges on saving Wano. This has been two decades of tyranny that they're trying to end. And any loose ends have to be cut sort of idea. That do or die attitude, it's fine, but at the same time, as because we know Law and because Law is a fan favorite character, of course, we're on Law's side in this. But Nami does bring up a good point in himself. And they're talking about... You know, would you talk if you were tortured? Like, I give it three seconds, I give it less, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, these two kind of would talk. That That's the way they are. Um, then we get uh, Yasu. And Yasu shows up, and he's talking all about, you know, the, the differences. Or, or not so much Yasu, but a combination of Yasu and those three members. Do you remember the three guys? Do you remember when we were first introduced to the Komorosaki, the courtesan? And we got the whole, she was playing, like, these guys for their money, these nobles for their money, and they would sell everything, just give them more and more and more money. We find out a few things here. The big things to take away from is that Otoko is actually uh, Tonoyasu's daughter, and he sold her into the service of the capital. Now, this might seem harsh right away, but this is something that was done in Japanese, Chinese, Korean culture for a long time. You basically sold your daughters away. You would basically trade your daughter's hand in marriage. Uh, even as far as back as the 50s and 60s, you would trade your daughter's hand away for a couple of oxes and a pig sort of idea. Uh, uh, some horses, anything worth uh, grains of rice, you know, big barrels of rice. That was the accepted practice that, okay, you're going to take care of my daughter and here's payment for it and stuff. Like, 
that was commonplace. And of course, this is more feudal Japan. This is before even the Meiji era uh, version of Japan. So it this is something very commonplace. However, in Ibisu town, where they're always smiling, and this explains so much about Otoko and how she's always laughing and smiling, why she can't stop, because she's a member of Ibisu town, of course, raised by the one that the, the granny refers to as the Buddha of the town. She, he is this, a lot of people are saying he might be Midnight Three Ox Boy or whatever, Three Midnight Ox Boy, I, whatever the terminology is. Um, nonetheless, that's possible. Some people are saying spy. Some people are saying this. I think he's important. I think he's a member. I don't think he's necessarily like Odin, but he could be somebody like uh, Orichi's brother. He could be someone related to the Kazuki clan that we didn't really hear about because he seems to be vital. He seems to be important, Long, like more so than just a spy or just this happy-go-lucky guy. He seems to have some form of vitality, and the fact of the matter is, is that Kanemon has already mentioned the three other Red Sheaths. We know there's no missing members of the uh, Nine Red Scarabs or Nine Red Sheaths, so it's not possible that he's one of these members. It's not possible that he's one of the samurai mentioned by Kanemon, potentially. So I'm sitting back going, this guy's important, but I'm not sure who. There's so many theories out there. What You guys tell me what you think about Tony Yasu in the comment section down below because I am open to so many possibilities with this guy. Um, but we find out, of course, uh, got sidetracked there, but we find out that when he sold his daughter, of course, uh, the money is slowly given back to him because uh, he sold her into service, of course, service to the courtesan. And even though it's a very measly amount of money, they do get paid, and uh, the little daughter is sending the father a bunch of money, and he's spreading it around. He's basically, he's the mayor, he's the Buddha, he's the he's the man to basically bring this town together and keep it happy, keep it smiling, even though he's always laughing, saying, you know, we might die tomorrow. And it's weird, because Shinobu and, like, everybody else doesn't know who this person is. This person seems to know a lot, of, so much information about the Kazuki clan, about the plan, about the people but they don't know who this person is. And that's weird for, you can understand that the people who time traveled, surely, but what about Shinobu? Shinobu being a, an original part of the Oni Waban group, which are basically ninjas, but at the same time are also information gatherers. They're intel. They are basically the intel of Wano. They should know everything that happens in the shadows and in, in plain sight. And even she can't seem to remember who this person is. And I'm sitting there like, there's so many possibilities. So once again, let me know what your guys' thoughts are down in the comment section down below. Now, the other thing we get at the beginning of this part of the chapter, which is something I don't really care about, is simply, remember the three guys that the, the courtesan basically, you know, worked to death, like, got all their money, got their riches, got their family, they sold their house, they sold everything to pay for the courtesan, and in the end, she basically used them, and that was our initial impression, and that's why people are kind of taken back by the whole, her attitude currently uh, with Zoro and everybody is because they believe anyway, at least Nami rings it up, is that they believe because we find out from the Ibisu town, the old lady in Ibisu town basically says, well, this is bingo, bango, and bongo or whatever. Uh, bongo, it's, it's a I, an O, and a U. So it's bingo, bongo, bungo, I guess. Anyways, these three are basically uh, scam artists. You know, one burns down the place, one collects, basically it's an insurance scam. So that's what they are. They prey on grieving families, people that die. They prey on grieving families. They prey on tax collectors. They prey on uh, insurance claims sort of idea. They're, they're the old age version of insurance scammers. That's what they are. And that's how they made their money. Of course, they all try to pay it off. And they are the same people that Usopp, or Frankie, one of them remarks, they're the ones that tried to attack the courtesan when she was making her way to Orochi's palace. Now, Nami brings up that she, that the courtesan knew all this, and that's why she was using them until they were basically spent of all their money. It was not malicious in intent like we all originally thought, that this woman is a diva. She's kind of very money, 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 but to a dark version of what Nami does, right? Basically, Nami at the beginning of the series, uh, without the tragic backstory. But here's the thing. There's too much exposition about this. I don't care. You could have explained this away in one page, and it felt like there was three or four pages all based on this, 
not so much on Tony Yasu, but about these guys. Like, we had two to three pages that they've shown up in Ibiza Town. They still think they're on their high horse. They still treat themselves like they're big, big names, but at the end of the day, they're not. Um, they've been used, and they're, and they're criminals. They're bad people, and they've been kicked out of the capital. But why do I care about these three? I'm sure they'll probably play some pivotal role in burning the flower capital in the end of days, and they'll convince them to help them with their pyromaniac, you know, skills or something, if that at all. And the point of the matter is, is this whole bingo bongo bango thing, it just reminds me too much of The Hobbit with, you know, Dory, Nori, Ori, Glory, Owen, Glon, you know, I was just like, Okay, I love Lord of the Rings, and I love The Hobbit, but I seem to remember that there were quite a number of the 13 dwarves that are not memorable, that did very little movies or books, and in the end of the day, in the history of the Lord of the Rings, they did not do much. They are not the Balin, the Dwalin, uh, Keely Feely, they're not the uh, Thor and Oakenshield, they're none of these people. The dwarves, the Orinori, the rhyming dwarves, at the end of the day, the Biffer Bomber Boffer, they are not that vital to the story at the end of the day and introducing them at this point in one piece, what does that do? I'm just, as I said, it's not a big deal. It's just, I was sitting back reading this and I felt like I could just skip it. I was like, okay, do, are these guys going to be important? Is any of them like a member of the Red Scarabs or something? Well, we already know who those are. No, so skip, skip, skip. You know, it felt very just to fill out the chapter rather than information that I wanted. I felt like we could have done more with Tony Yasu's backstory uh, rather than explain what these three's situation is, you know? Um, after this, we do jump back to Udon Prison where we see that Luffy is still kicking ass. Now, here in Udon Prison, Luffy is basically failing to unlock the second skill set, the other skill tree that is ornament hockey that uh, Hyorogoro the Flowers is trying to teach him. Now, he keeps smacking him with regular ornament hockey. Hyorogoro's trying to help him, but he keeps taking out all these guys with regular ornament hockey, the vulcanization, the black ornament hockey. Now, Queen is sitting back, and here's, because of this line, a lot of people are going off on this theory. Uh, I've seen it across a lot of forums today and stuff, that Basically, Queen is trying to train Luffy because Kaido wants that challenge. I don't believe, I don't put much stock in that theory. I think people are just trying to read into every little bit. This is Queen's entertainment. Basically, remember, if anybody's watched Spartacus or anybody saw the movie Gladiator or something, at the end of the day, remember that that's basically what this is. Queen is basically a, a dominus or, or a member of the Roman, you know, sort of idea. And they're watching, they're sitting down. And they're watching gladiators fight. They are the strongest warriors. They are the most powerful warriors. But they are there for their entertainment at the end of the day. So this whole idea of like, why is he letting them do so much? It's like, because it's entertainment. He's there, he's chomping down, he's eating. It's, it's, it's their TV screen. That's what it is in Wano. This is, a, this is just a gladiator match. And so I don't, I put more stock in the fact that this is their entertainment rather than this is some diabolical planned by Kaido and Queen, who have shown us so much intelligence and so much forward-thinking planning to train Luffy while in prison with Hyorogoro the Flowers. Yeah, I don't know. That's a bit of a stretch for me, guys. I mean, if this was Shanks or Rayleigh or somebody like that trying to do some, you know, or even Crocodile, like somebody with some actual that has showcased some forward-thinking levels of planning and intelligence, I would go with it. But no, there's been no indication of this for me, so I, I don't really prescribe to that theory. Now, at the end of the night, they basically say, you know, this is over, we're, we're going to start again tomorrow, sort of idea. So they're laying there and they're saying, well, I, I still didn't learn this version of hockey. Now, this version of hockey, as we know it, uh, we've seen Zoro use it, and we've seen, of course, Rayleigh use it, and we've seen Sentamaru use it, and potentially we've seen Kyoshiro use it. If we can assume that the courtesan is... Hiori, the, or at least, at the very least, the same woman that Zoro has met up with right now, that is the same Corazon that got cut down. This could indicate the fact that he cut her but did not cut her sort of idea in there. Could have been one of those blood packets, they made it look good or whatever. Um, or he made it look like it was just a surface wound. She does have a cut, but it was only surface level and she made it look worse than it was sort of idea. The, the whole ability to control your sword, what it cuts and what it does not cut, 
This is something that Kyoshiro clearly indicated when he cut down the cortisone. So another potential for this version of hockey. Now, this is where we basically get a recap of what's been going on. Uh, Luffy explains like, okay, these are the Yonko, this is Kaido. He uses Conqueror's Hockey for fun to take out the guards so they don't overhear the plan. They talk about Kanemon. Caribou shows up, so Caribou's still there. Where Kid is, we still don't know. Did he really escape the prison or not? That's kind of left up still ambiguous. But Rizo was hidden inside of Caribou. Now Caribou, of course, Rizo shows up and said, You're Hyogo of the Flowers. We can trust you, you know, blah, blah, blah. You are the, one of the great Yakuza bosses. And they talk all about the Yonko. They talk about the Kaido Rebellion. They talk about everything that's going to go down, pretty much. And this is where... Hyogo or the Flowers states, okay, well, there's a few things. Number one, Caribou basically, like, lies through his teeth to get Luffy just to get him out of prison. And basically, Luffy's like, all right, yeah, if you've had a change of heart, I believe you. We'll trust you. You can join. And Caribou, this is hilarious because a lot of people are comparing this to the whole, like, Buggy or Mr. Three or whatever. Like, this is Impel Down 2.0, and it does feel that way a little bit. He's collecting a bunch of random characters some that are members, some are past people, some are, you know, it, and a lot of people are comparing this to Buggy in this sense. And it is kind of funny because Caribou is actually so terrified, he doesn't believe that Luffy's that stupid. He doesn't understand that Luffy is that good natured and that oblivious and that stupid to believe people at their word that. Caribou's terrified that this is a trick, and now he's more doubly on guard to not betray Luffy. So in a weird type of way, Caribou is now more, even less likely to betray the Straw Hats or betray this Rebel Alliance or betray anybody, simply on the fact that he's so nervous that Luffy has some plan in the back of his mind or something. So I did like that. That was kind of amusing, honestly. Um... Ryzen brings up that his abilities will be very useful. Hirogoro even brings up that Udon Prison is actually set up, kind of looks like the world government symbol, except with a fifth circle, you know, like the you could make the star out of it, the pentagram star, and all that stuff. Uh, it, it's built in this version, and um, there are four other sections similar to this one. So clearly, there could be other members. Maybe Killer. Where's Killer at? Like, we saw a kid in prison, but we haven't seen any high nor hair of Killer. Where's Killer? Uh, the other old Yakuza bosses, all the samurai that, and even Hirogoro the Flowers brings up, okay, these four, these four other sections, remember that, yeah, there are scumbags in here, and there's like pickpockets and criminals, but the majority of Udon prison is simply people that defy Kaido and Orochi. They're simply samurai that refuse, sort of like uh, what happened in the Meiji Restoration when there was a number of samurai and warriors that refused to give up their swords and give up their way of life. They did not care that the Meiji government was established. They were not, by their honor, this was worse than death to live like one of them, sort of idea. So, in the same idea, all these sections, these other four sections, are filled, filled to the brim. With all these other characters, we get silhouettes of past Yakuza bosses. Hirogoro believes that he's going to be able to convince them that clearly a lot of them, at least some of them, are still alive. The old Yakuza bosses, he'll be able to convince them uh, to join the cause and he'll be able to convince everyone else. He brings up the fact that he thought he was going to die a dog's death, that after 20 years, he was probably in there for a very long time, remember. Hirogoro kind of brings up the fact that he gave up. He gave up. It might have been after five years. It might have been after ten years. It might have been even fifteen years. But he had basically resigned himself. That's why he looks the way he does now. He stopped rebelling. He stopped trying to fight it. He just gave up the fact that in the end of the day, he was going to die. There was no hope. Nothing was going to happen. But he finds out about the twenty years. He finds out about the time travel. He finds out that Kinemon's alive. Momonosuke. There is still power there. That like Odin's son lives. And they can fight against Orochi. There is a rebellion brewing, and it's not just on a small scale. It's the final rebellion. This is going to be the do-or-die situation. And he gets that fire burned up, up in himself again. Similar, like, almost... Remember that Hirogoro kind of had that kind of fire rekindled with Straw Hat sort of idea when he saw, like, Luffy and doing what he did? It was almost like the start of a spark. Now it's turned into a full-on fire. This is a full-on flame ready to be ignited and ready to be back to what he was and stuff. So 
I'm hoping Hirogoro, during this time, does what Luffy does. He bulks himself up. He uses this opportunity in the prison and while escaping with the other four sections and all that stuff to bulk himself back up. Because remember, he's now he's old man Hyo form. But we saw him as a tyrant. We saw him bulked up and powerful and ready to go. I'm hoping that in the same way that Luffy has been using this opportunity to train, potentially Hirogoro can get himself back to maybe not prime form. Of course, it's been 20 years and he is an old man, but at least get himself beyond what he is. Clearly, he still has power of hockey. He can still use hockey. Um, so it would be really interesting to get him back to that level. And we saw him with a sword in the flashback, so potentially he is a very powerful samurai. That This is his version of hockey, but if he had a sword, he'd be ten times as strong. We don't know. But I'm really excited. The first half of the chapter, as I said before, was just, meh, it was okay. Some exposition about stuff I didn't really care about. But here, here we're getting some battle plans. We have Caribou, we have Ryza. They're going to release Kawamatsu. Uh, Hero Goro's ready to go. Uh, he's going to teach Luffy the new hockey. They're going to, there's four other sections. And at the very end of the chapter, Big Mom has arrived in Udon. Big Mom has arrived with Chopper and everyone. So this is going to be a big thing. This is going to be huge. What is Big Mom's reaction going to be? We all said a lot of people are hyped for Big Mom versus Queen. You know, that is going to be a thing. I love it. I'd love to see this. And remember that Big Mom right now does not have her memories. And I don't think anything here, I don't think seeing Luffy or anybody is going to trigger her memories. I think it's going to take something else. I think that that this is more Act 4. We're, our, we're still in Act 2, remember, of the Kabuki play. And potentially, Kabuki plays either do the 3 or a 5 act, depending on the length, depending on the style given. We can assume from this, this is a 5 act play, I'm going to assume. And I don't think Big Bob's going to get her memories back until Act 4. Act 4 at the climax of the entire thing. Because Act 5 in a Kabuki play, or the final act, is usually the, um, I guess, the wrap-up. The, alright, here's the happy endings, here's the epilogue sort of idea. The climax is always the act right beforehand. So, really looking forward to the Big Mom showing up in Udon, what's going to happen. Um, are, are they going to kind of miss each other? Are they going to kind of go like this? Like... Big Mom's crew is going this way, and Luffy and Hero Girl's crew is going this way, and they're just going to kind of skip by each other sort of idea while escaping and stuff. Big Mom's going to crash the prison from the left, and Luffy's going to escape from the right. That'd be kind of, you know, comedic in a sense. Um, and then Chop is still going to have to deal with Big Mom for a while. But uh, anyway, that's the chapter, guys. What do you guys think of the chapter? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you like the review? Did you hate the review? Please like, subscribe, comment as always. It's always very much appreciated. We'll see you back here next time uh, for Chapter 941. No break for next week, so that's a big thing. Uh, we are going to have more breaks coming up in the following month. May is going to be kind of haphazard, but nonetheless, still excited for 941. I think it's going to be a really big chapter. Uh, as always, drink responsibly. This has been Griever. We'll see you next time.